Welcome to the Captain's Corner, your place to get informed about first steps to recovery and how we help to create healthy and safe communities. During our live episodes, we share inside views, real stories and educational resources. And today we are having a topic that we started last week. It's called, it takes a village and it really takes a village to create safe and healthy communities. And that's why we spark the conversation with our agency partners here in Red and Center Alberta. Today, we are super excited, Kath Hoffman and Kirsten Hoyer, which is me, Kath Hoffman, our captain. We are super excited <laughs> to welcome Rob Lewis today. He is with Youth HQ. Hi, Rob. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Thanks for having me on the, in the captain's corner. It's yeah, you're welcome. Here. You're welcome. Let's talk about our youth today and um, how how Youth HQ helps them here in Central Alberta to feel um, safe and, and, and healthy and stay healthy. Can you um, introduce yourself, Rob, and share a little bit about what you do and what um, Youth HQ does before we dive deep into uh, our topic of today? Sure, happy to. Uh, my name is Rob Lewis. I'm the Executive Director at Youth HQ. Uh, Youth HQ is located on 49th Street, just east of the casino downtown, as you're heading towards the hill, leaving downtown. Um, you might not recognize us as a, as a business, so to speak, or a nonprofit, because we look like just a big house on the south side of the street. Um, however, within that house, we have several programs. Uh, we have a permanent 24 hour, 365 day a year shelter that welcomes Red Deer's youth as needed. Um, and youth in, in their context talks about uh, kids essentially in their teens, so uh, 12 to 18 years old. And then we have another, a couple of other programs that we run. Um, you're likely familiar with Boys and Girls Clubs and Big Brothers Big Sisters. So we run both of those programs out of this facility as well. And out of this facility through the Boys and Girls Club or BGC, and the Big Brothers Big Sisters programming. We serve communities um, in Red Deer, Delburn, um, Spruce View, Springbrook, Penhold, Benalto, um, and recently in the Poplar Ridge. Always looking to expand. There are another couple of locations that we are looking at putting boys and girls clubs into uh, within Red Deer. Uh, we just opened one in, in Eastview. And we're looking at the Bower area to see what we can do over there. Um, our, our programming here um, operates um, a kind of a kind of a built-in wraparound system. So um, through our programming uh, with our big brothers, big sisters, and boys and girls club, which also uh, runs Camp Alexo in the Nordic area, um, we offer preventive services. So we try to interact with youth um, to give them that chance, to give them that ability, to give them that opportunity to really find success, connect well to family, connect well to um, adult mentors and so forth, um, to try to keep them out of the track that's going to lead to any sort of destruction in their life. However, there are those youth who find themselves in that track and uh, we definitely want to be there and help them meet that their need as well. So we offer a programming through our youth shelter, which is open to any youth regardless of the circumstance if, if there's a youth between um 14 years old uh, or sorry 12 years old and, and 18 years old and they need a safe place to land then we can definitely give them a give them a space wow rob if those youth were higher intoxicated would you still be able to take them we are able to take them which oh, is good. which is something that's been added just in the last few years um so we are a no barriers facility now right on that's so great to hear. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's great. And then of those 12 beds, um, is that indicative of the need, do you think? Like, do you have to turn people away ever due to lack of space or is that meeting um, the need? Yeah, great question, Kath. I don't remember ever having to turn anyone away. So. Um, I, I don't, in fact, ever remember the shelter being at capacity. Okay. Um, uh, however, right now, because of COVID restrictions, we're we're running at about half capacity, just for spacing purposes. Um, and and we do fill up that half capacity, but we still haven't turned anyone away. 
Um, mm -hmm. Typically, because people don't live in our shelter for an extended period of time, typically kids will come in or youth will come in and it's two or three days and until we can get them connected into something, help them find that route back into a safe place to stay um, within right their on. community at home or with a, with family or friends or whatever the case is. Yeah. So we, we actually, it's kind of a funny thing. We, we look at our successes as, as um, if we can have an empty shelter, that's successful for us. Yeah. Um, not because we haven't let people in, but because we've been able to move them back into a place where they don't have to stay on site, where they're yeah. you know receiving the services and they've got the connections where they can go back and live in community safely. And, and, and then we interact with them through outreach services to make sure that they're finding that success that they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, awesome. That's the best, like the way you just described that is such a great way for shelters to be able to work. You know, I remember when we used to operate People's Place Shelter that the Mustard Seed operates now, you know, people were there basically 21 days. It was to get, catch their breath, right. maybe get a little damage and rent together and off they went, you know, right. um, and that's, yeah, that's ideal. Uh so that's yeah it's interesting to know about that need and i'm assuming you uh, you can correct me of course that mm -hmm. youth have opportunity to couch surf too yeah they do definitely stuff, hey? yeah for sure and that and means that's yeah, so it's a safe place it it does it can yeah. be a place you know it can be the safest place for them and and the, the thing about um youth um recovering and, and rebuilding and, and, and restoring the damage that whatever damage has been done or whatever circumstance they're coming out of is they have to feel that um, that they're at home, that they have to feel like they can be themselves, right? So yeah. great staff here, friendly, wonderful staff who work at the shelter. The shelter comes with obviously um, structure, um, which which is good because yeah. sometimes that shelter is what they or that structure is what they need as well. Yeah. Um, but to be able to um, to land back in community and find their own success, supported by organizations like ours, um, within a place that is more at home for them, I think I think goes a long way for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. That's um, cool. Rob, how like what is the, the typical? Um, and a typical journey for someone um, coming to the youth shelter? Like, why do they come and how long do they usually stay? Sure. Um, the reasons they come are varied, of course. Um, we had 2,500 crisis calls last year. Um, of those, uh, we had 210 intakes. And of those 210 intakes, we had uh, about 102 of those you said that without the shelter, they're not sure what where they would have landed that day. Yeah. Um, they would have been on the street. They would have been, you know, in whatever circumstances they found themselves in. Um, often, probably the top three reasons that kids end up in the shelter um, is substance use and abuse within the home. So maybe it's them, maybe it's their parent or or their guardian or other siblings in the home. Um, the other uh, thing that happens a lot is, is violence in the home, so it's just not a safe place. Um, so um, we'll have kids who are removed from the home and brought to the shelter. We'll have kids who leave the home and come to the shelter. And uh, the other one is runaways. There are, are quite a few of our youth who land at the shelter because they're just fleeing and uh, they're getting away from whatever they're getting away from. And they end up at the shelter, which again, that's a great thing for them. A uh, great thing for us because then we get to be part of their part of the process to finding their way again. Mm -hmm. And so, how many staff do you have that that um, works in the in the shelter? Uh, we have a crew of about ten. Um, some permanent, full time, some part time, some who do relief for us um, on holidays and that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we run three full shifts for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Yeah. And Rob, so when did um, when did you guys, how long have you guys been operating shelter? How many years has that shelter been going uh, on? That's a good question. I So my journey here at this, <laughs> this organization, I was here about 15 years ago for two years as the program director. And well, then I, I didn't know that. A whole bunch of things. 
and I'm just back, right? So um, I long after they started. So I'm thinking it was the early 80s um, or late 70s when the shelter uh, actually started. So the shelter was the first part of the building. And then um, Big Brothers and Big Sisters um, was the, the next to be added. So that's when the building was expanded. And then Boys and Girls Club was brought in after that. So um, I always tell people um, in the 80s, <laughs> is when yeah, I hear I, you. But that's so cool. I mean, yeah. they've been, they've been for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, a long time. And that preventative work that that you're doing must be paying off dividends. And, you know, like you said, the Big Brother, Big Sister, all, all of your programs and stuff that when you consider that that shelter need hasn't had to rise exponentially over the years, um, things are going all right, you know? Definitely. And it's, it's really neat having the three services in house because some of the youth that come into the shelter end up getting matched to a mentor in Big Brothers Big Sisters, or they get referred to go to camp in the summer. So, um, you know, it's, it's, our, our programs are like soup. They all just kind of get blended together and, and we reach in and we pull out what's necessary and ben most beneficial for the youth. So we meet the youth where they're at, right? And, yeah. um, you know, the shelter is obviously more of that crisis situation, um, but but there are a lot, a lot of youth who have benefited from the other programming um, because they came in through the shelter and because we we offer that as part of our our service delivery menu of services or whatever you want to call it yeah that's cool mm -hmm. so you Kristen, that, big, to, oh, go ahead sorry i just wanted to finish answering the question before i forget um so typically they'll stay seven yeah. days at a time um and then we'll reassess and um so they can stay indefinitely but there are periods where we reassess their situation connect with the family have that conversation um, or if they're with social services, children's services, we'll reconnect with children's services, have that conversation, um, and then make a plan from, from there going forward. So uh, we definitely, uh, we will never send anybody out onto the street. Um, we will never send anybody out if there's not a safe place for them to land yeah. um, where there's some permanency. Um, but we do have a cycle that we try to work through because, again, our goal is to help them reintegrate, not to become dependent on the on the services that we offer. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Rob, did you did you feel that or did you see that through COVID there were different challenges um, than before COVID in terms of um, building connection on friendships and um, or even like challenges at home? Had has that changed or? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, us, like anybody else. Will obviously point to the, the the pressure that's put on families, um, and sometimes that pressure just squeezes people out, or it it heaps upon them, right? So um, there there's obviously been an increase in um, substance use, in domestic violence. Um, so we are you know we are seeing that reported in in the populations that we serve. Um, broader though not just within the shelter but outside of the shelter and our other programs yeah. um, there's lots of conversation around how isolated the youth feel and how they've forgotten how to connect with people and how they miss that connection so we we've, we've run all of our programs all the way through um, we work within the restrictions so sometimes it's on site Sometimes it's virtually, sometimes it goes back and forth. Um, and, and definitely uh, our staff in the Boys and Girls Club, which is typically a, it's a club-based activity where kids get together and play and do activities and learn skills and things like that. Um, the first couple of times back when we were able to, to house them again in our club facilities, staff said it was just odd. It was, you know, these kids that they knew a year ago and now they're interacting with and they're a year older and they've gone through that year with, you know, virtually with just their family or parts of their family and they're back in club and they're kind of looking at each other, not knowing how to interact and, and how to, you know, how to work in that, in that group that used to be one of their primary friend groups. So um, they got to get said, their think, groove back. kind of. Yes, definitely. And, and I, like I said, I think we have a lot of, uh, you know, we'll have some definite um, 
mental health challenges and issues that we uh, we get to be part of the solution for. And, and so we're kind of bracing and preparing for that type of thing where kids are coming back and, and where the needs in families are just greater. And, and when the family need is greater, then, you know, that, that's always uh, reflected in, in the youth and children yeah. within that family. Yeah. But you just mentioned the families. Like, do you work together with the families as well? Or um, is it kind yeah. of... Yes. So we have two programs in the shelter called Youth in Transition and Young Adults in Transition. And the whole purpose of, of that, of those two programs, is to transition um, the youth back into their families. So um, our Youth in Transition, our outreach worker, will work with the family to determine the safety of the situation. Um, is that the best place to go immediately or is it a longer term plan and maybe there's something in between. So there's there's that side of working with families through the shelter programs. Um, in Big Brothers Big Sisters, it's, it's a different type of working with families because they're bringing um, their kids to us to say, uh, we'd like a mentor for our children. So we get to know those families well and um, and then we get to interact with those families and with those youth and children um, in concert with the mentoring relationship that we've introduced. So uh, we get to, and then of course at, at the Boys and Girls Clubs, we have lots of parental volunteerism and, and we meet the parents as they come to drop off and pick up, pick up their youth and children at the club. Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's important for us to understand, you know, at, at least at a very basic level, we have to have that relationship with the family. Um, yeah. in order to serve the youth and children because the context of the service is within the family unit for the most part. Yeah. yeah. So plus um, the added bonus of that, those connections, those families are making too, to your staff and your teams and to other parents and stuff. That's, you know, you're not just supporting the youth, you're supporting the whole structure, which is really cool. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah. So I have a question to both of you, which we haven't talked about before. <laughs> so I, I, one of our listeners today, um, I'm, I'm just in a chat with him. So he lost his son due to overdose and he's wondering, is there uh, a support for, for families that lost um, a child here in Central Alberta? Do you know of what, like, what can they, who can they talk to and find help? Well, yeah, definitely. You, you go, go ahead, first, Kath. You know. You know, okay. <laughs> go ahead. Um, it's definitely not a service that we have in, within our organization, but there are a couple of places that they can connect. So, um, 211 um, will give them, uh, if they just call 211, that they should give them some services that are specific around grief and loss. Um, um, I don't know at this point in time if there's something specific to. Um, you know, loss of a loved one due to overdose within the COVID context at all. Um, but definitely there are resources for families uh, to take advantage of uh, because of, of suicide or, or death in the family. A uh, 211, I think, would be one of the best connections to make there. I, I think also maybe the Family Services of Central Alberta might have some information. And if they can't, if they can't serve them, they, they'll uh, definitely be able to point them in the right direction in terms of counseling and support for, for families as well. Uh, just And just to add to that, there are many parents out there in the same situation as that poor man who just lost his son. Um, mm -hmm. And they're aching for that support. And they've come together in their advocacy for attention to the opioid poisonings and a really strong um, advocacy group for that is Mums Stop the Harm. Mm, yeah. And uh, if he's on Facebook, and obviously he is, if he Googles that um, group, they are, that group is made up of parents who've lost their children. And so that support, not just through that group grief, but also, which is tremendous, uh, but also through um what how do i help make how do i help this you know in the name of my son how do i help others you know that's um that's a good connection too that he might find some good support in yeah okay I so I'm, 
Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay. you just reminded me of another resource, um, Help Seekers. If you just go on, on Google and search Help Seekers, it'll also mm -hmm. co help connect through different, um, you go to Help Seekers site and then it gives you a um, new search keyword. So if grief is one of, or um, overdose, then it, it will help sort out or provide a list of local agencies that, that can support mm -hmm. families in need. Awesome. Well, and yeah, I mean, it's happening far too often to far too many. Uh, once is too often. And yeah, uh, my condolences, our condolences for sure. Yeah. Definitely. So I will, I will put the, um, the resources and the links in the, uh, in the, in the chat later on. Thanks. Yeah. And then we can share that. Um, Okay, so um, Rob, do you have you know our our listeners they they like um, they like to hear <laughs> stories? Like, do you have a story of someone that recently who came in and um, who you have helped? That's great because I love telling <laughs> stories. Um, <clears throat> my wife and child will attest to the fact that I never stop talking. So, <laughs> um, actually, we just had. Uh, one of our she was our, our outreach worker so she runs the youth in transition and young adults in transition programs um she, she is within our shelter team and she was out at a community event um this was when it was warmer so i'm thinking it was uh, late summer early fall and um a young lady came up and we'll call the young lady susan um so susan comes up and says you know i, th I think i know you and and she says, well, I'm, I'm not sure. And she says, are you, you know, Tammy from the new shelter? And, and she said, oh, yes, I am. Um, and of course, uh, Tammy is, is uh, you know, looking at, uh, and again, Tammy's a fictional name. Uh, she's thinking, well, I've, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of youth over my 20 years of being here. So she says, well, let me tell you a little bit about my story and see if you remember me. And, and this uh, particular young woman, Susan, had come into the shelter in her early teens, so 14, 15, um, all sorts of things going on in her life that she was trying to sort through. And um, she really had some interesting success, but it was a journey that took four or five years. So she would make some headway, go back in the community, come back, not where she started, a little bit, you know, a few steps ahead, but you know, but back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And this, this went on for about four years. She left the facility um, and didn't really stay in touch with us at all, which is not unusual. Um, she ended up going on, graduating from high school, getting her post-secondary degree. And she's now got a, she's a successful career woman. She's got a couple of kids. She's in a long-term relationship that she's been in for a while. And um, she got to tell that story to this staff member who was one of the one of the part of the team who um, who got to work with her. And you know she um, she reminded us of the fact that um, without the shelter, she did, she's not sure where she would have ended up, right? The 14 year old kid going through all sorts of challenges and she's not sure where she would have ended up. but because of the shelter, because of the care, because of the, the you know the, the tough structure, love and compassion that we provided, um, sh she was one of the people who got to um, really have that second chance, and she took that chance, and she responded well to the to the challenges that we put in front of her, and yeah, now she's now she's an advocate and a supporter, and and uh, you know, and she's just a wonderful um, example of the difference that, that that can happen when when you have you know some good some good influences and um, adults who can mentor and, and uh, help along the way. Yeah, a safe place to spread your wings from. Fly Definitely. back when yeah. you need to. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. And then did Tammy remember her after she related all that? Stuff? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. then they chatted about, you know, kids and grandkids and, and you know, yeah her life back at the, you know, as she went through that and they remember the stories of when she was a little bit of uh, a bit of a challenge, shall we say, and, you know, yeah. the crying times in the kitchen and all those things. So, it, <laughs> so when I heard the story, um, it like, it literally brought tears to my eyes just to see the joy in that staff member's face, knowing that yeah. she was an integral part of that person's journey. 
and to reconnect with them after the fact years later um you know what a what, what a rewarding thing to have happen mm -hmm. well and you know when i have people staff that are coming to the harbor and they come because they want to help just like mm -hmm. of course your team does right we want to help we want to make a difference and i have to show them they find out very quickly that they can only help this much but to that person right then this much is everything yes that Definitely. safe place right and yeah. then you'll help again that much and again just like you explained rob you know and who knows years later if you're mm -hmm. going to be susan and tammy running into each other saying holy doodle we're all yeah. <laughs> sunshine lollipops and rainbows over here yeah yeah that's so cool yeah, we never know what um, those kind kind acts of uh, kindness or just a few words, they can have a big impact. You yeah, never know. take it through yeah. your whole life. Yeah. Um, Rob, if, um, if, if people would like to support a youth HQ, like, can they get involved? How, how can they help? How can they volunteer? Um, do you have any, I don't know, um, requests for donations coming up for Christmas? Is there anything people can help you with? Uh, definitely. So on, on all fronts, both fronts, uh, volunteerism and fund development, um, you know, we're a staff of about 30 people. So our reach is fairly small, but we've got a volunteer staff of thousands of people. Um, so um, if you want to get involved, um, you can just connect with our agency. Uh, you can come in, you can phone. There's a get involved link on our website. Um, we've got a process that we'll go you through, take you through to make sure that you're trained up and ready for success in whatever program you're wanting to be active in. Uh, if you're wanting to contribute, you can contribute online um, anytime. We do have uh, donation links for our Big Brothers and Boys and Girls Club programming. They are registered charities, so um, all donations are receivable. Currently, we have a couple of things that are going uh, for Boys and Girls Club specifically right now. We we're, we're have a raffle that's wrapping up this week. So, um, Catherine Kirsten, if you need tickets for that raffle, just let me know. and and I'll sell you a couple of tickets. And so they're $10 each. Um, and it's uh, a flight using WestJet and uh, some uh, Radio Rebels um, prize package as well. And then- okay, I could win that, Rob. You could. I'll give you, you 10 could. bucks if you let me win. Okay, oh, I'll let you win. <laughs> I don't know I'm, not sure if, <laughs> I'm not sure if the person making the draw will let you win, but I'll, I'll let you win, Kat. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, Maybe that's where the head comes in, Kath. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. um, so the other the other event that we have coming is uh, we do a, an annual online uh, crowdfunding event. So this year's event is called Oppor Opportunity Changes Everything. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. it's an online event. So uh, we'll have a site that comes up and links off of our uh, Youth HQ mm -hmm. site. Um, you, the funds raised from that event will support all programs. Um, through in, in youth hq and some um, the, the trick to a fundraising event online like that or a crowdfunding event is is give if you can but um at the very least share so yeah. when that event goes up um you'll see it on facebook you'll see it um you'll both be getting it from me personally because i'll send out the link um definitely have a look um send it to the people that you uh, you know, included in your social, send it to the people that you're in contact with. Um, that'll run from November 29th to December 31st. And it's really tied into Giving Tuesday as kind of the launch of that and uh, gives folks the opportunity to uh, contribute for over the course of the Christmas season. And um, again, um, those that giving is receivable. And uh, you know, we're, we're always, always happy to um, enjoy the support of, of individuals in Red Deer and Central Alberta. And we have some outstanding corporate supporters as well who, who really bring a lot, um, a lot to the table in terms of ensuring that we have what we need to do the work that we need to do. That's really good. Awesome. Like really good. Now I'm jealous of you. We need to <laughs> yeah, but I don't have a captain's hat. So. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> right. fair enough. <laughs> awesome. 
Thank you very much, Rob, for uh, joining us today. I think that was um, very informative and uh, to find out like what you are up to and also how people can help you and get involved. Um, so for everyone who has been listening to us today or watching the replay, please go ahead, follow Youth HQ on their Facebook page. And um, if you would love to get involved, please uh, check out their, their website and the opportunities listed there. Don't forget to buy a raffle ticket. Yeah, um, right away. <laughs> <laughs> right away over this week <laughs> um yeah so thank you very much rob it was a pleasure to have you here and uh, let's spread the word the, the word the word in the world mm -hmm. and uh, make our communities safe and healthy for everyone awesome good. so much appreciated thanks awesome. rob steady thank as you she very goes much. <laughs> steady bye. as she goes bye bye be well <laughs>